what we're going to do this morning is we're going to continue. Um, we began this series a number of weeks ago uh, called Upside Down. And um, what it is, it's simply walking through um, this thing called the Sermon on the Mount. And so if you grew up in church, you know what Sermon on the Mount is. If you've never heard of that before, it's simply called Sermon on the Mount because Jesus goes up on a mountain and he preaches a sermon to uh, his followers. And um, he just sits down on top of this hill and for these three chapters, Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, and Matthew chapter 7, Jesus just kind of <laughs> rolls through this. We kind of read through it too quickly, but he rolls through this amazing sermon and essentially he's just teaching them, but, but here's what he's doing Every word that comes out of his mouth is flipping everything upside down. I mean, in ways that you can't even imagine. Like, he, he, he's, they're, they're, he's not what they expected. He's not what they were waiting for. You know, they're looking for Messiah to do all things their way, this way. And Jesus, with every word, is turning their, 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 their hearts upside down. And so, number one, he's doing it to the Pharisees, which a lot of what we're going through um, in the Beatitudes is him literally speaking to his followers and at the same time giving a right curve right outside the back of the followers and punching the Pharisees in the face, which I love that. Hug and punch at the same time, right, Kippy? And so as he's talking to this, number one, this is my, I would like to do reenactment of what all the disciples look like through the entire three-year ministry of Jesus. Hold on, you ready? <laughs> this is what I imagine what <laughs> the disciples look like because Jesus is saying stuff to them and you could just see, you hear it in the words of Peter and you hear it in, in John and you hear it through these guys that are walking around. They are just not getting it until later, right? Holy Spirit falls. They know Jesus is resurrected. Then they're like, oh, which is how I spent half my life, right? And so, and then the Pharisees, everything he's saying is like poking barbs into their whole world because they've completely missed the point of what they were supposed to be focusing on. And he's calling, to, calling them to the mat. And so um, these three chapters of Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, but the first part of this thing is called the Beatitudes. There's Eight things that Jesus walks through, and they're literally just um, the Beatitudes at the heart of it is just, if you were to crack open the heart of a man or a woman, and Jesus is essentially saying, this is how we walk in the true blessed life now. I know there's a lot of theology about your blessed life now, but the blessed life now really exists in this when we obey Jesus and we walk in his ways, his statutes, his heart. Um, he's saying, hey, these are the things that come from somebody who loves me, who's following after my heart and wants to do things my way by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is how you receive the biggest blessing in your life. And so he talks about these uh, eight sweet things. And if you read them from afar, they seem kind of simplistic to somebody. But if you know the context, uh, it's everything. And so as we started this journey, um, this is part six. This is Beatitude six. Part one was poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, was part two, blessed are the meek, uh, blessed who hunger and thirst for righteousness, blessed are the merciful, and this week we're going to talk about blessed are those who are pure in heart. Everybody say pure in heart. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, you can open if you want, if you've got your Bibles, or you can also see it, it'll be up on the screen. Um, this is what Jesus says, as I just said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see who? So um, when I'm talking about purity for a minute, when I say pure, what are some words that come to mind? Righteous, okay. Clean. Unblemished, that's great. That's really great, great word, word usage. Yeah, um, purity is, um, is, is this really complex yet simple thing. And so as we read through it in the scriptures, when Jesus said blessed, uh, literally that word, Macarius, that, that word in the Greek literally means your ultimate blessing. And we're going to talk about that every week. Jesus is saying the biggest blessing, heaven blessing inside out, not outside in thing is when you do this. And then he says, we'll just look at the definitions when he says pure, uh, there's two angles with this word in the Greek uh, for this word that is pure. Number one, it literally and physically means clean or pure and has the idea of unsoiled, free from dirt, uh, unalied, uh, without blemish, spotless, free from impure admixture, or free from adulteration. And the second part of it is, is undivided. So when we talk about the word pure, it's two things. It's, it's not dirty. It's not soiled. You know, and on the other hand, um, where it comes in the context is to understand is it's like this. When Jesus says you can't um, love God in the world, you can't love God or, and money, you can't. That's an undivided thing. What this word pure is, 
really hits home on a one-track mind, a one-track heart that is devoted and dedicated to something that is pure. It's not half over here and half over here, kind of in the kingdom, kind of not, kind of in love, kind of not. Whatever it is, it says, blessed are those who are pure, undivided, okay, and have a pure heart. And so the word heart in the scriptures, it's literally like this. When I say, when blessed are the pure in heart, or, or Mike, I love you with all of my heart. When I say something like, what am I saying? Am I saying I love you with this pumping organ in my chest? No. <laughs> Les says yes, but no. And so what happens is when you say someone has a big heart, it means you know they're a good person, they love people. If you say it in the true form of heart, if someone has a big heart, they have an enlarged heart, they're probably about to die of a heart attack. So that is not the context, right? You have a really big heart, yeah, no, <laughs> it's over, Okay. Sorry for those of you who have lost somebody that way. Um, <laughs> but the word is, it, it's really, it's, it's, it's the center of a person's life. It's your inner person, the center of your being. It's, it's kind of who you are. And so in here, and so, um, and so Jesus is saying the biggest blessing comes from people who are pure, undefiled, have a, uh, have a, they're not split in two in their inner personal being, their heart, their insides inside of them. And so... Um, Here's the deal as we talk about this. Context is everything. And so when you hear Jesus say this, you're like, okay, pure in spirit, good person. Uh, but you don't understand, who is he talking to? He's talking to Jews. And so when you think about the context of this, this is like bombs dropping. Because here's what Jews do. Jews live a life of ritual purity. Over and over and over and over and over again, they are trying to purify themselves. It starts back in Leviticus and it goes through the scriptures in the Old Testament. There's all these rituals and things that they have to do over and over and over again to be pure and in four major areas. So number one is dietary. Everybody say dietary. So in the, uh, to, be a, to be a true testamental, uh, uh, you know, uh, Levitical following Jew, um, you had some very disciplined guidelines for you. And so there were meats you couldn't eat and there were meats you could eat, right? And so a uh, cow... Good. Piggy, bacon, bad. That's why I couldn't be a Jew, right? There's this cloved hooves and there's certain birds and fish, but you can't eat shellfish and all these kind of things. And so it's a purification. The Lord is saying, if you look, I'll, I'll just read you. Leviticus 11, 8 says this. You shall not eat of any of their flesh. This is a list of animals. By the way, read Leviticus 11 right before lunch. It's just going to bless your heart. And so, and you shall not touch their carcasses. They are unclean to you. They're unclean. They bring a dirtiness, a filth to you. You're supposed to stay away from these certain kind of foods. Number two, um, if you had leprosy or a skin disorder, they had a huge issue. Does everybody know what leprosy is? Um, we don't, thank God, we don't see it as much here now, but I've, I've seen and heard of cases in different parts of the world where it's still there. But literally, it's like this flesh bacterial thing that gets into beyond your skin and starts to rot your flesh. And people literally will have fingers fall off. They'll have ears fall off. Their noses a lot of times will fall off. It's just rotting. So in the Old Testament, um, it's pretty clear. And to be a Jew was you had to avoid these people with everything you had. If you look through the scriptures in Leviticus chapter 13, when a man is afflicted with a leprous disease, he shall be brought to the priest and the priest shall look, and if there is white swelling in the skin that has turned the hair white, and there is raw flesh in the swelling, you're welcome, it is a chronic leprous disease uh, in the skin of his body, and the priest shall pronounce him unclean. He shall not shut him up, for he is unclean. That for shut him up thing is, if it's questionable that you didn't have leprosy, possibly that they would hold you up and quarantine you in this area, and after a week or two, you couldn't be around anybody, you could come out, and then the priest would evaluate what's going on. If he didn't, he would say you're clean if the things went away. But if he said that you were unclean, that was it. You were cut off. You were not allowed to be around society anymore. So you can imagine at the outskirts of town and outside of Jerusalem, which is, by the way, why it's so powerful what Jesus does with lepers. And so people are on the outside, and anytime anyone came near to them, they would have to shout, unclean, unclean, like they walked in this constant pit of shame, and they couldn't be around their families, their wives, their children, their husbands, whatever it was. They were kept away, which is so brilliant because what does Jesus do? Jesus goes and he wraps his arms around lepers and heals them. Like, isn't that, oh, Jesus rocks. Amen? Um, but they spent their whole lives avoiding unclean people to remain pure. Here's another one. 
uh, dead bodies. So it was a very big deal to be around a dead body and to be a Jew because it was said to be unclean. And if you were around it and touched it, it would make you unclean. So check this out in Numbers chapter 19. Whoever touches the dead body of any person shall be unclean for seven days. He shall cleanse himself with the water on the third day and on the seventh day, um, and so be clean. But if he does not cleanse himself on the third day and on the seventh day, he will not become clean. Whoever touches a dead person, the body of anyone who has died and does not cleanse himself, defiles the tabernacle of the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from Israel. Because the water for impurity was not thrown on him, he shall be unclean. His uncleanness is still on him. Listen, if you even carried your own dead child and brought them into the place for burial, and you did not go through the cleansing process to be purified, and by the way, this is a bigger wire God created all these things. It's a bigger picture of we needing a deeper cleansing from our sin and the nastiness of filth, why Jesus is so radically the answer to that. But you couldn't bring your own children to somewhere to have them prepared for death and not do the ritual. If you didn't do the cleansing ritual, you would be cast off and treated like a leper. You would be cast off from your people. And fourth, um, we'll spend just a little bit of time on is, is sexually. So in the Old Testament, there are huge guidelines for being sexually pure, and they had to do this after this after this. Think about it. We see it in the New Testament a little bit with women who are bleeding. So if a woman was going through her cycle, in, in, especially in the Old Testament, guess what? She was unclean. She had to stay away. No relation. She, she was put away. This is why it's so amazing also. Jesus, Jesus is in the New Testament. Remember, and that lady who was bleeding for 12 years, she just, she races through the crowd and she just touches his robe, just the tassel of his robe and she's healed and he turns around and he's like, who was that? Like he was amazed by her faith, right? She didn't just do that. Think about this. She didn't just push through town at her own risk of seeming silly. She was not supposed to be there, let alone touching a rabbi. And she did, but she was unclean. But here's the deal. So Jesus is saying, blessed are the pure in heart. And what he has just done is completely pillaged and ravaged the world of the people he's speaking to. Because they, especially the Pharisees, they had become men who mastered religion. They went to temple. They did their ties. They did their stuff. They were holy on the outside, pure on the outside. Is everybody tracking what I'm saying? They understood what it was to do the law. They spent their whole lives doing purity. And in one sentence, <laughs> Jesus completely rocks that upside down. He turns their world upside down. Can you see why they hate him so much? I've lived my entire life trying to be pure. And then Jesus, here and in other places, he comments, and we'll talk about that. He looks in, he's like, yeah, but blessed are the pure in heart. Like those external things, <laughs> They're not necessarily a reflection of what your real problem is. It's your heart. And so he rocks their world. Um, Spurgeon said this. He said, Christ was dealing with men's spirits and their inner and spiritual nature. He did this more or less in all of the Beatitudes. And this one strikes the very center of the target as he says, not blessed are the pure in language or pure in action, much less blessed are the pure in ceremonies or in raiment, or in food, but blessed are the pure in heart. Here's the deal. God's heart and concern is for the heart of man. And God, above anybody else on the face of the earth, knows and sees our hearts. Like he knows them. Right? Um, we, we, we look to the scriptures and it's 1 Samuel 16, 7. It says, and this is the Lord talking to Samuel about um, David and Saul. And he says, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't look on his appearance or the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees. A man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the, on the heart. Right? It's not about how you know, the Saul was this brawny, tall guy, but inside he was a coward of a man and wasn't honoring to the Lord. And the Lord simply tells him, hey, it's not about the outside. It's about what's going on inside of here. And so um, that's a problem. <laughs> that's a problem, right? Like if God knows my heart, 
Uh, and what comes outside of my heart if we're going to be, is anybody in here naturally pure? Because I don't want to waste your time. I'll just give you some money for lunch and go on down the road. Anyone naturally pure? Someone close? Meeks is pretty close. All right, praise God. I didn't really have a lot of money for your lunch anyway. Okay, good. Uh, here's the deal. Here, uh, Mark 7, 21 through 22. If God knows our heart, this is what Mark 7 says. It says, from within, out of the heart of man, Come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. <laughs> what comes out of a man's heart? Brokenness. Filth. This is why Jesus calling them out is like completely puncturing him. We'll go back to you know, some of those verses we've talked over the last few weeks. Matthew 23, 26 through 28. He says, you blind Pharisees, first you clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones. Listen to the context about being around dead. He's saying not only are, are you impure, but you literally have, it's like you have dead people's bones in you, which for them was completely a no-no, completely impure. He's saying you've got dead in you. But within you are full of hypocrisy. Oh, excuse me. So you also outwardly appear to be righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Straight from Jesus again in Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say this to you, that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his So their offering was, look at me. And his offering was, uh, you might not have slept with her. You might not have slept with him. But the problem is not your external. The problem is the internal, and you've already done it in your heart. That's the problem. John Piper has a sweet little quote. He says, what you are at the invisible root matters as much to God as what you are at the visible branch. So in many ways, if we're going to be honest, um, this stuff should nail all of us because I think there's, we get into the, we're not, um, I wouldn't say you're a modern day Pharisee, but here's the deal is we all try to do this at different points, don't we? We will edge up our church attendance and I'm serving on a team and I'll read my Bible and I'll do my thing and I'll try, I'm trying to not fill up my cuss jar as much. How many of y'all have ever had a cuss jar? No one in here? Oh, Mike just nudged Michelle. That's not a good sign. <laughs> cuss jar, you know, you, you get all, you know, you start, all right, every time I cuss, I'm going to put a dollar in the jar. And then a week later, you're like, well, maybe I'll put a quarter in the jar. And then as it fills up, you're like, well, how about a dime or a penny? Let's just, let's just say, let's just not. We'll give God some IOUs. Amen. <laughs> but we're doing church. We're doing Bible study. We're doing stuff. And Jesus over and over and over again, as he says to the Pharisees in Revelation, he's kind of talking to his church. He's saying, hey, you're doing all these things things, but this smells like death, and that's a problem, um, which, by the way, the whole thought process, and maybe this is you in this room, it was me at one time, uh, I'll go to church, and I'll come to Jesus when I get some of my stuff cleaned up, like, that's, that's this thing, and I've, I've had that conversation with some of you people in this room, like, I, I can't really join up now because I'm doing this thing and I'm really trying to get this thing straight. I'm really trying to not live in sin with this guy or yada, yada, yada. In the end, here's the point. You can't. That is the point of the gospel of why Jesus is so good. Everybody sees religion and Christianity as just things you can't do. The only thing you can't do in Christianity is save your butt. You can't. That's the point. The scripture, he knows you're wicked. He knows you're broken and he loves you still and he gives you salvation and grace and mercy, not legalism and laws. We follow because we have, not the other way around. Amen? And so um, why has always been the question? Like think about, think, about, think, about, think about Eve, and I don't want to run off an isogeek too much, but what was God's beef with Eve in the garden, in Adam, I'll include him, uh, in the garden? Was it because the fruit was so precious to him? You know, uh, some people call it an apple. I call it a kiwi. Right? They, said it was, they didn't say what it was, but to me, a kiwi is much more sensual, right? more alluring. And so they ate of this, and God was like, hey, wait, that's my fruit. You can't have that. You weren't supposed to touch that. What was the problem? 
It was their hearts not trusting the God of heaven and trying to obtain more than almost the everything he had already given them. It's the heart. Abraham, he just, God sends him to test his faithfulness to him, tells him to lay his son on the altar and sacrifice his only son. He gets up there to do it, and it shows your heart, 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 heart is the heart of the matter. Amen? And so we are not naturally pure, and that's a problem, right? Like, i, I got to be honest, y'all, I, if we could just take a little serum this morning, this is what, I would love to be a part of this church service, kind of, until I got my feelings hurt. <laughs> but if I just gave us all a little truth serum this morning, we all did in a little communion cup, and we just said, and I just said, let it go. Say it. Say all of your wicked thoughts, all of the stuff that's in your mind, just let her fly, baby. Let's see what happens. What do you think would happen in this room if that was the thing? You would, <laughs> it would not be pretty, right? Why? Because we have... Uh, I got to tell you, uh, just a man, and you know, I try to be transparent about things, but I have and have had wicked, wicked thoughts in my head. I'm not talking about the version I tell other people. I'm not telling, telling the half tale I tell my wife about lust. I'm talking about the real things that go on inside of my brain, inside of my head. They are so filthy and wicked and nasty, and every single one of you in this room have had the same thing. Every single person. Like, we are wicked. Our hearts are, 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 are wicked. And so, you know, motives. I've done things out of the right heart. I mean, excuse me. I've done things eternal, externally that look right inside. They're the wrong motives. I've helped people so I can get back. I've said nice things so I can get things back. Like, over and over again, I've done nice things, and my motives have been garbage. Is anybody else in this room? Anybody feel what I'm saying, or is it just me? I don't even have to pay for counseling this week. This is going to be good. How many of you have wished harm on people? How many of us have actually wished that someone would die? Right? I think our hearts are wicked. Um, the other part of this, as I was thinking, I was praying through, is not only internally am I dealing with wickedness, but what is not helping me are the things externally in the world. Like, when, you know, when I look at my kids, and I look at my little baby girl, and I've seen all my kids from, you know, obviously from the time they came out till present. And here's one of the biggest things that breaks my heart. When I look at my seven-year-old little girl or my sons, whatever it is, I know what's coming for them, and it scares me deeply. Like, right, like, if it's true that one now in every six to five girls gets sexually abused, I have two daughters. Like, I hate, I hate that. I know that people are going to crush them. I know people are going to break their hearts. I know that when I was little, I would wake up on a Saturday morning. How many of you remember the Saturday morning? You get up, you actually slept well, right? When was the last time some of us remember sleeping well and getting up going, woo? Some of you are still young enough that happens. I don't want to talk to you. Um, <laughs> they, oh, gosh. But anyway, we get up, I used to get up and I used to go play, and I didn't have a care in the world, except when I didn't come home on time, Mom was going to chap my rear end, and she did well. Right? And I remember over the years, as I grew up, that started to get stolen from me. The first time um, I saw a guy OD, a dude in my neighborhood, and we were living in Southern California, this guy OD'd, he was dead, um, ambulance was there to pick him up, cops were at this house around the corner from my house, and I pull up on my bike, and there's these other thug kids from the neighborhood, guys I used to run with, kind of punks, and I said, hey, what happened? And they're like, oh, he got stoned, dude, and he's dead, you know, which they didn't even know what they were talking about, and I'm like, stoned? I was like, you mean like someone threw rocks at him, like Jesus or something like that? That was my answer. And you can tell what kind of chastising I got after that. But listen, like everything in life started to pull away purity from me, pull away. Not that we were ever pure, we're of sin, but my mindset was not nearly as wicked as now because the world we live in, man, it's just throwing wickedness at us all the time. And so we're getting it from the inside, we're getting it from the outside, and then Jesus said, hey, the biggest blessing in life is to be pure in heart. And then we go, how in the world can I do that? I think of a lot of us, I think in our journey as believers, I think we know Jesus can help us stop doing things, hopefully, but I think a lot of us give up on the fact that Jesus can actually completely transform you from the inside out to not only quit doing external things, but to have a new heart that doesn't even want them anymore. And that's a horrible mindset for all of us to be in. 
Jesus, help me to quit doing stupid stuff. When the real answer is, Jesus, God, help my heart not to ever want to touch that again. And that, brothers and sisters, is where the real power of Jesus for us on this earth comes. And so how do we become pure in heart? Well, the first answer is you don't. <laughs> you don't do it on your own. You're not going to be able to do it on your own. You're not going to, everybody try to be pure real quick, right? Just on your own. <clears throat> don't blow anything. But you hear what I'm saying? You're not just going to try to be pure and it happen on your own in your flesh, I'm saying. But listen, when we look to the scriptures, you know, and, and the scriptures echo this. Proverbs 20 verse 9 says, Who can say I have made my heart pure? I am clean from my sin? Question mark. Right? Like, that's what, the, <laughs> that's what he's writing. It's like, who, who, who can say I'm pure from my sin? I'm pure from my No, you're not. Here's the deal. The only thing that makes us really pure is Jesus. Like Jesus is the only real purification for a man or woman from the inside out that happens anywhere on the face of the earth at any time. Matthew 19, verse 26, it says this. Jesus looked at him and said, I love this. Come on. With man, it is, this, this is the rich young ruler, right? This guy comes up to him and he's like, hey, I'm doing this, 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 and this. And Jesus said, hey, great, I want that. And he wants his money. He wants him to get rid of his stuff and to come follow him. And what does the dude do? He walks away. <laughs> And then even out of the words in one of the Gospels, Jesus says, man, it is hard for someone to get into heaven. Jesus says that. This is why and I butchered this in first service. I said something about a dollar bill getting through a camel's eye or something. But this is where Jesus said, it is easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than a rich man to attain salvation in heaven. Think about that for a minute. And so this is what's going on here, and this is, this is what happens. Um, excuse me, he says, with man, this is impossible but with God, all things are possible. Like it's possible through him and through him only to have a new heart, amen? Isaiah chapter one, verse 18 says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they're unclean, they're impure, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. That's what happens when Jesus moves in, right? He comes in and he purifies us and he cleans us. Jeremiah 32, 38 through 39 says this, they shall be my people and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. Ezekiel eleven nineteen says, I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. This is what happens upon salvation Jesus, this is, I, I love this. Jesus is in the heart transplant business. Think about it. The scriptures say we are the righteousness of God, yet we are still impure. The two things don't come together. What has happened is God is through our salvation, it's twofold. He has put in us a new heart. He has given us the capacity, the ability to have a new heart. He has given us his heart. That's what it is to be a follower of Jesus. Now, people will start to make the assumption that because I still do external things, my heart must not be right. My argument to that is you have a new heart. The problem is we don't know how to walk in it. And we continue to walk in the filth and the nastiness because it's what we know. And what I'm telling you is you have been given the new heart. You have to learn how to walk in the new heart. Like God really transforms the heart of man to be something new. Somebody say amen. Amen. God bless you. I appreciate that. Here's the deal. <laughs> um, and what I said earlier is key. I've spent most of my life thinking that Jesus will help me stop doing externally stupid things, but I'm going to battle through a lot of these things for the rest of my life. And, and coming from an addiction standpoint, this is why I hate when we talk about recovery groups. Uh, hi, my name is Rob. I'm an alcoholic. Like, I understand what it means. Like, I battle with alcoholism, or maybe you're in another group with narcotics or, or whatever it is, sexual impurity. Like, I understand what it means that I battle this, but in the end, what am I doing? The Lord said I am new. The Lord says I have a new heart and I'm still calling myself death. Amen? Like it's one thing to battle with it, but it, it's almost like we don't set ourselves up to be free. It's like, well, I got my sin struggle. God can change the heart of man. Like he changes people. He changes them from the inside out and he can change you. And some of us don't even think on that spectrum. We're just thinking, God, help me not screw this up again. But the God of heaven can do surgery and put in this new heart that he has and actually teach you how to walk in it by the power of his Holy Spirit. Haters can turn into people who love. 
People full of unforgiveness can be people of forgiveness. People who could be angst and angry and full of fear and, and, and trepidation, all this stuff, they can be delivered from that and be people that are confident in that peace. Either that's true or the gospel's not. Because it says, I've put a new heart in them. They are the righteousness of God. You are not who you were. Amen? Amen. It's a big deal. It's never, ever, ever been about behavior modification. Ever. Jesus didn't come on earth to make less murderers. Jesus didn't come on earth, earth to make less harlots. That was not his agenda. His agenda was to set the captives free. His agenda was to heal the sick, to raise the dead, people that were spiritually dead, and give them life. Here's the great thing. Not only can, man, can God heal a man or woman from lustful actions, but he can heal a man or woman's desire for it. Not only can the Lord help somebody not do drugs, <laughs> but he can purify the heart of someone who battles addictions to lose the desire. Not only can Jesus help you forgive someone, but he can purify your heart to actually set you and them free. Amen. Not only can he help you deal with your wayward kids, <laughs> but he and he alone can purify their hearts in love and obedience. Amen. Amen? Like it's another level of God's goodness that I think we pass over. Like God can heal the heart of man. And so... It's twofold. We talked about part one. One, we can't, only Jesus can. Part two is, how do we walk in that? Are there things, like a lot of people, we always sway one side or the other. It's either complete legalism and do, or it's like this over grace, which I hate saying that, but <clears throat> what I mean by that is, well, I'm the righteousness of God, you know, I just do whatever I do, and the Holy Spirit's working in me, and I'll eventually turn out like, Billy Graham, whatever, whoever you look up to, you know, and then on the other side, we're like, do, 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 do. And I'm telling you, like, the place is a place of freedom in this middle. But we have a job in this pure of heart thing. And it isn't this. It's not obtaining a pure heart. It's walking in a pure heart. There's an immense difference. And so when we talk about these are the things we should do, the legalism flag will come up. Hey, that's legalism. We're free in Christ. Yeah, I'm free in Christ to not sin anymore and walk in the goodness of God with a pure heart. See the difference? It's like so backwards by how so many of us think about church and about Jesus. And so I just wrote down these things. What can we do? Uh, Billy Graham said, but God also purifies our hearts day by day as we submit to the Holy Spirit and with his help flee from evil and seek what is good. Blessed are the pure in heart. And so I just wrote down a few of these simple things that I think are just helpful. And so Number one, how do we do this thing? How do we live pure in heart? How do we grow in a pure heart? And, and from the scriptures, it's just, we, we need to ask him for help. Like David, David is busted, right? David has, has, has slept with a woman. He was supposed to be off in war. He got lazy. He stays behind. He's looking out the window one day. There's some hottie up on the roof taking a bath, which is weird anyway, right? But that's cultural. Up there taking a bath, he goes. He sleeps with her. They have a baby. He gets his husband killed. Uh, her, not his husband killed. That's a different version of the Bible. Her husband killed, and it's a big mess, and he's just totally laid bare, walking around in guilt. He gets called out in it, uh, you know, from, from this guy. And then all of a sudden, in Psalms 51, you hear the heart of David. He's so clean. He says, God, he says, create in me a clean heart. Oh, God, and renew a right spirit within me. Like, that's his cry to heaven. Not, why did you let me screw up? Or, why didn't you take my temptation? David's, David's calling was this, God, give me a new heart. God, purify me from the inside out. John 14, 13 through 14 says, Whoever asks, whatever you ask in my name, this is one of those quoted texts a lot, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Like this is where a lot of prosperity things get a little tweaked in this thing. Like Lamborghini, Jesus, Go. And I hope to see one outside. But here's the bigger deal. Jesus, when he says, what you ask in my name means when you ask things in my will. For a minute, do you not think that the God of heaven, it is not in his will for you to be purified and be more like him? Yes. We need to ask. Like, when was the last time you prayed, not for the external thing? God, help me be 
Quit being, you know, so ticked off at my wife or yelling at my kids and instead and say, Jesus, I am a wicked. These things that are coming out of me are wicked. God, will you give me a new heart? Will you, will you soften me to, in my anger? Will you, will you bring me out of this place of being like a time bomb all the time? I've prayed a lot of days, God, help me quit doing dumb things. <laughs> right? Anybody in here ever? Just me, me and Mike, right? Somebody else? Oh, back here. Um, but here's the deal. It, it's not, it's like, God, would you break the wicked that still remains inside of me so I don't do those external things? It, it's inside out, and he does. Here's another one besides asking him for help. Number two, um, we need to look at him and, 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 our, and his example, follow his ways. You know, what would Jesus do? The bracelets, how many of you had a what would Jesus do bracelet? Come on, one, two, like probably like 17 of you in here, but nobody wants to put up their hand. Think about it for a minute. Jesus is why makes the what so much more beautiful and powerful, right? Like he died on the cross, great. Why? Scripture said because he loved us. <laughs> he so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And so as I look at the life of Jesus and I want to look at his why, I want to go after his heart. I mean, the scriptures are just clear over and over and over again. It says in 1 Chronicles 28, it says, if you seek him, he will be found by you. Like if you want his way, you want to do what he does. Psalms 86, 11 says, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. John 14, 21, whoever keeps my commandments, uh, has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me and he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. By the way, uh, most people think that this is a reiteration of what we're talking about, the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. This literally says, whoever has my commandments in them has me and loves me, my father will manifest, show himself to them. Like as we walk with Jesus, as we capture his heart, as we imitate the God of heaven, Man, we just get to see more and more of God, and he teaches us how to be pure. Is anybody in here used to be super chronically wicked about something, but over the years? Like, I used to be a man of intense jealousy. I can't even tell you what a wicked, nasty heart I had in jealousy with my wife, anybody around me, ministry, all these things. And I'm telling you, because of time and beating, and but a new heart of God, like, those things have been delivered and taken out of my heart. For one reason, because I know I'm so fly, my wife couldn't possibly go anywhere else. <laughs> Just checking to make sure you're still here. But number two, and you know what? You know what? One great way to save your marriage, man, lead your spouse to Jesus and let him capture their heart. Amen? Um, this seems... Simple, but here's another thing about learning how just to walk in the pure heart. <laughs> if you're longing for a pure heart, you have to get away from impure things. You know, here comes, the, you know, again, the, oh, he's telling me not to do this, that, and drink or chew, go with girls that do, whatever that thing is, right? I must be older than some of you. But here's the thing, like, I've had so many people come to my office and like, all right, pastor, I'm in, and I want to do this, but they refuse to quit yoking themselves with people that are cancerous. They refuse to quit walking with that man or that woman they're in that relationship with, and all the same time saying, God, I want a pure heart, I want a pure heart, I want a pure heart. It doesn't match up. If you want to be in a place of purity, the things in your life that are easily to a point, you have to get away from them. If we, if we look at the scripture, 2 Timothy 2, 22 says this, Flee youthful passions, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. If there are people in your life that are toxic and cause you to go backwards, guess what? Man, you need to purify your life and get them out. If there are places that cause you to stumble, if the computer causes you to stumble, this isn't legalism, this is freedom talk. This is you saying, I want to be close to the God of heaven. I want to be pure. It's never legalism when your heart is to honor and be closer and purified and be close to Jesus. Never. Um, I just wrote this. You can always tell when someone is serious about their new heart because they can't stand to be where the old heart hung out. That's when I know people are legit because they're like, yeah, yeah, uh, I, don't, I can't be around him anymore. I just, I can't do it. I, I, gotta, I gotta stay away. Can I hang out with you guys more? Can we do this more? I'll, you just hear the language differently and you can see when someone's gonna, gonna succeed. Uh, and so if you take out impure things, um, 
Okay, let me, let me give you this. How many of you can stop thinking impure thoughts by telling yourself to stop thinking impure thoughts? Anyone? All right, I'm not thinking about that woman over there. I mean, how does it work, right? I mean, it doesn't just happen by your will. You don't just will those things out. So here's what happens. What, when you take something out, you've got to bring something else in. You've got to bring pure things into your life. This is why like, when we talk about God's word, it's not just, i got to read the Bible. It's the word of God. It's purity. It's putting, taking out garbage and putting in good. When we pray, worship. Sometimes when my heart is stank and foul, I literally, I don't want to listen to anything. I don't want to talk to anybody. I'll sit in my office and I will push the play on my iTunes playlist and I will crank it up as loud as I can because I have to, I know I don't want it, but I know I need it. I know I need a prayed heart of praise. I know I need worship to come and infiltrate my mind because my mind is wicked. You can't just unthink pure things and expect them not to come back if you don't fill your heart with something else. You watch crap all the time and garbage, guess what happens? It sticks. If you fill your heart with new things, it changes your heart. Amen? Put in pure things. Uh, here, here, I just want to say this one gently, and this is big, but and this is big for me. If you, if you want to really walk in this pure heart that Jesus gives us, you have to stop hiding your impurities. I know, um, because I just, uh, I've been the same way in the past, as there are people in this room Maybe you, but you are hiding something. Like you've done something, you've said something, you've thought something. Maybe it was yesterday, maybe it was 30 years ago. But here's what happens. When we leave those things in our heart, they begin to rot and to rot and to rot. And we keep trying to pile all these good things. I'm going to church and I'm, I'm not cussing as much and I'm doing this, but you've got this thing in here and Jesus is going to do you just like he did the rich young ruler. You're going to list out all the things you're doing, but because he loves you, he's going to say, I want that. Give me that. Because the longer it stays inside of you. I, I had a guy come to my house one time. I love this man of God. He called me one day just crying and crying and crying. He's like, i got to come over and tell you something, brother. And after that, you're never going to talk to me again. I mean, this is how he, I was trying to take my pastoral Sunday nap, so it was a little annoying. I'll confess that. I'm like, he's like, i really got to come talk to you. I'm like, okay, I'll just, I'll be out front waiting for you. And so this brother comes over, and he just goes, and he spits out all this stuff. And he had done some pretty nasty stuff. And what I went was, ah, unclean, and I ran down the street, and that was it. And, I, you know, I purified myself. Obviously, I didn't run anywhere, but anyway. I walked with quicken, quickening speed. But here's the deal. He got all of it out, and this was my answer. Man, thank you for sharing that with me. I don't know how you carried that for 10 years. Man, if your heart is repentant, the grace of God is on you. And, and you know what? This, he, he, he later, years later, went to be with the Lord. But he was one of the most freest men I knew. And he had been so bonded for so long. When you keep things in, they rot. And whether you think about them all day long or not, it doesn't matter. They're causing damage. And the Lord of heaven is saying, and you're like, well, I can't. I'm going to be embarrassed. Some of you have to confess things that you know could end your marriage. They could cause people to walk away from you forever. They could cause some of you to go to jail. I don't know. What I do know is eternal consequences are far heavier than short-term consequences on earth. And the God of heaven loves you through the whole thing. Listen, y'all, I have seen men who have sexually abused their own children. Right? The worst of the worst. Confess and be changed and healed and die in peace. Nobody wants to talk about that. Whatever you have in your spirit that is not of God, God is not saying, hey, you big idiot, stop it. He's saying, why would you leave that in your heart? The blood of Jesus heals everything that is rotten, but you've got to get it out. The scriptures say, confess our sins to one another so we might be healed. When I confess to Kip, Kip doesn't give me salvation. He doesn't heal me, but as I get it out and I get accountability, it comes out of me, and whoa, I can be set free. Some of you are carrying around garbage, and you're so much shame, and Jesus is in there going, you're just a big moron. He's going, come on. I gave you a pure heart. 
Get those dying bones out. Confess. I forgive you, but you've got to bring it. And there's so many people in the church on the verge of collapse and explosion because they're so afraid of confessing what they've done. And Jesus is saying, and by the way, if the church doesn't welcome, isn't a place for people to come and confess, they're not the church of Jesus. This isn't a safe place for sinners to walk in the door and, we can, and then the repentant wanting change. We can't take whatever they say and to bring a new place of confession and receive them and love them and train them and teach them to walk out of it. Then we're not the church. Uh, I truly believe this. Um, <laughs> when hearts change, uh, people, families, and society changes. Like we, we look at our country, and I, you know, I don't want to get beat up for this, but um, you know, we're so big on social justice, so big on, on rights, and I, I'm way down. I think Jesus is all about rights. But in the end, if the heart of Jesus doesn't touch people, how will the external things of our country ever change? Right? Like, the reason why we're so wicked as a nation is because we took the Ten Commandments off walls. No! That's not why. I mean, I, I'm, don't, I'm not against the Ten Commandments. Nobody sent me nasty email more than I usually get, right? But what I'm saying is that the, 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 the Ten Commandments, they, were, they just became a shrine. Our hearts changed. We stopped loving Jesus and running after him and being in the church. We started entertaining everybody and we quit going. We became selfish. Our hearts became wicked, and now it's coming out. The only way to change men and women that are walking into abortion, walking into sexual impurity, and, and other lifestyles that don't honor Jesus, I can't browbeat them. But only the blood of Jesus, showing them who Jesus is and purifying their heart, will change our nation. We'll break racial inequality. We'll break abortion. Thing after thing after thing, and there's so many Christians yelling and demanding it, do it my way, and, and, and it doesn't smell like Jesus at all, and it's not going to break, and it shouldn't. The end of the text simply ends with this. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I mean, Job says this in Job 42 in a different context, but he, he says he's having a bad day, Job. Uh, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now, now my eyes have seen you. Like, that's what it is to, to walk with Jesus. Like, how do we see God? So it's two, two, two contexts, right? We're going to see him, but we see him now. Like, how many of you, since your heart has been changed, like, I see him everywhere. Like nature, right? Like the mountains. I'm like, whoa, there was a great earthquake and an expanse and things rose up. You know what I mean? And instead, when I look at it now, I go, God, who is like you? Who paints like you? Who creates like you? Who does that? I look at my kids, I see the eyes of God. I look at you guys and I see God in this place, like how God's healing and restoring. Like I, I see God all over the place. In my best days, I see him. And in the worst times of my life, I see him. I'm not alone. I'm not by myself. Everywhere I go, because he has given me a pure heart, a new heart, I see God everywhere. And I can't forget that because my eyes so quickly want to look at all the junk. Amen. When I read his word, I see him. When I'm in the church, I see him. When I look in the nations and I see other people of different tribes and colors and tongues and nations, I see him over and over and over again. I can't not see him. Well, you can't see God. I, I cannot not see God. He's everywhere. That's what happens when we're prick is we start seeing things through the spiritual and not just the physical eyes. Like, y'all know that God is here. Like, we're seeing God right now through his word and through each other and through worship and through restoration. Like, we're looking at him. Amen. Right? And, and, the, and the end of this is we see him through, you know, the, the scriptures talked about this cloudy mirror. We see him now, but, but later we're going to see him. Like literally when the end comes, when I die and go, or when he returns on the clouds, it talks about this, you know, in 1 John 3, all this stuff, but I'm going to see him. I'm going to see him. I'm going to see Jesus. I will literally see God. When I get to the heaven of heavens and I'm with him, I'm going to see him. Paul is going to have to come. They're going to be bouncers in heaven. They're going to have to come pull me off of that man because I'm not going to want to let go of him, right? And there's going to be, you know, hopefully grandpa over there and, you know, Kevin Minard and, and, and my father-in-law are over there playing craps, which I don't know why they're doing that in heaven. You know, all this stuff is going on. But those things pale in comparison 
to the one that I will see. God, you know when you see Jesus, all this stuff is done. All brokenness and heartache and your lusting and your anger and your fear and your lack of peace is done once you see him, when you put your eyes on Jesus. That's what it is to be a believer. Not some legalistic jerk who thinks he's better than everybody else. It's people who know they were garbage. They were without any hope and we had Jesus and now we're purified. And not only that, but he's doing something in us day after day after day after day after day. He is making us pure. It's not about the things you're doing on the outside. It's about what's going on in here. And he knows all of it and he loves you still. He died for that, and he wants to change your life. Matthew 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. 